Hello, welcome to uh, a, I suppose our first visual edition, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, of Much To Do About The AQ. Um, we, we're also putting it obviously on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts and normal places, but for the first time we're recording on Zoom from our own houses uh, online. So apologies for any poor sound quality. I left my microphone at work because I'm a cretin um, and Christian is just not very good at things like that. <laughs> So um, yeah, we've established yeah. this. Yeah. Yes. So apologies. Um, so some exciting news to begin with. Our next two episodes are actually going to be um, our first special guest. Uh, we have the inestimable um, Elizabeth Winkler who will be joining us next week. Um, author of um, Shakespeare Was a Woman and Other Heresies. Um, and she is, she was a fantastic guest. I mean, we've recorded them both. She was genuinely brilliant. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the following week, um, the the outstanding, hugely erudite, brilliant uh, Dr. Ros Barber of Goldsmith Dest- University. Yep. Destroyer, um, destroyer of sycamore theories. <laughs> yes, indeed. I was going to mention that. Um, and we do have some errata to, to mention of a previous episode. Oh, yes. Um, yes. So um, it turns out that the, uh, the theory relating to the sycamores... Um, that has been put forward that uh, Shakespeare couldn't have possibly known about them. They only grow on the east side of uh, is it Verona. I think it's the west side of Verona, outside west the city gates. Yeah. Yeah, and then it turns out they've not been there very long at all. Yeah, they're younger than me. <laughs> yeah, and um, not me. I'm I'm still having that, but yeah. um, they're they're not very old these trees whatsoever. So um, not a valid theory, and we're not here to spread disinformation. So that's kind of um, a little bit of a faux pas, but we're glad to be corrected. So thank you, Dr. Barber, for that. And please do listen in in a couple of weeks for more from her. And that's also a video one. Um, we, we've since discovered that um, Zoom, when it records, if you if you put someone as the pinned person, it only records their face. Yep. So um, look forward to... Can I, can I just mention that I wore a shirt for both those interviews? Uh, I didn't. So. You didn't? Okay, right. <laughs> I, I, just I wore I'd... two. <laughs> I just thought um, I'd be middle class about this. But anyway. <laughs> um, to the, tonight's episode also brought to you, it is the evening, um, <laughs> hence my Christmas tree lights being on and it's in December. Tonight's episode brought to you by Belgian beer. <laughs> Thank you, Belgium, for providing us with beer. <clears throat> yeah, I, I don't have any to show, but some has been imbibed. But I'm over 18, so it's all good. It's all fine. Yeah, um, I am just about as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, what we'll first start with then, what we're reading this week. Um, I, uh, we had the great fortune today <clears throat> to um, pay a visit to the, the Marlowe Society's library. And by visit, I mean obtain. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, it was a, basically a ram raid. <laughs> yes. Um, we did. I mean, we didn't do that much ramming, but we certainly did raid. Yes. <laughs> so well, now we, yeah. now we have the Milo Society Library. Um, it's now being hosted at the school where we work. We we are the curators, as it were, of the Milo Society Library. Yeah. Um, we are the the keepers of it. Um, although it does still very much belong to the Milo Society. Um, yes. And hello to them if if you are listening. Um, the, thank you very much for your help today as well. Um, in moving it, so I have um, borrowed from the Marlowe Society Library um, H. Amplett's uh, book, Who Was Shakespeare? Mm. A, um, an awesome question a book that neither of us had heard of. Um, yeah. It does have an introduction by Christmas Humphreys, which is the greatest name I've seen in all of today. Yes. Um, but yeah, so far I'm only, I'm not far in. Um, I'm using a, a um, 1960 newspaper cutting that I found in the aforementioned um, Milo Library as a bookmark. I'm only 20 pages in. Uh, so far, I mean, nothing new, but um, it's, it's very good. It's quite, enjoy- quite an enjoyable read. Mm. Yeah, I'm reading, um, and this is kind of a, a combined shout-out advertisement and what I'm reading notice. I'm reading Francis Bacon's Contribution to Shakespeare, A New Attribution Method um, by Dr. Barry R. Clark. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and, and I did say to Joe earlier that I would use this opportunity, this filmic opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Clark for reaching out to us and emailing and um, offering to come on the show, the podcast, whatever, 
Uh, and 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 yes, we 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 definitely accept your your offer. Thank you very much. We'll 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 have you on in the new year, no doubt. Yeah. Um, but you'll have seen in the Twitter feed those of you who follow my uh, uh, craziness online uh, that I've been looking at the book and, and and posting snippets about it. And I think the the thing I've noticed that's most relevant, without delving in further, really, because it's all in the Twitter feed, is that this is a Routledge Studies in Shakespeare publication, which hmm. kind of it gives the lie to the theory that um, mainstream so-called scholarly uh, publishing houses won't uh, publish uh, books, uh, texts on the, on the AQ, or as we have been saying all day on AQ adjacent theories. Mm. Um, this is Dr. Clark's uh, 2014 Brunel university PhD. And it's, um, Let's just say it's beyond stylometrics, and it's into something that he he nameth. Um, of course, I won't I won't be able to find it, will I? Because I'm I'm terrible at kind of prepping. Um, but um, it's it's something. Here we go. It's the RCP method of stylistic analysis, which is the rare collocation method. Um, <clears throat> so obviously, that's what I'm reading. You'd want to read it, people at home listening in yep. uh, to understand it's a fantastic book so far i'm a bit like joe i'm 30 pages in and so far it's just kind of rehearsing and, and, and analyzing the usual kind of why the guy from stratford wasn't the author of the plays but so far very interesting book yep and uh, when we're both done with those we'll swap them over and uh, each read the other because um, they're both really interesting other than that i'm also um, i'm also doing some research at the moment my current research focus is on the death of hamnet shakespeare uh, because I'm looking for any evidence of his death having any influence whatsoever on the Bard's work. Um, so far, I've not turned up anything. No, nope. no, it's interesting because a lot of uh, Stratfordians we keep referring to them in that way, but I suppose that's the best way to to proceed. Uh, they mm. they reference the Hamlet death, <clears throat> um, not not the you know not the death of Judith or Susanna. It's just Hamlet, Hamlet, Hamlet. Um, as significant and as informing the uh, the the uh, creation of of Hamlet, as though Hamnet and Hamlet were interchangeable names, they are not. Um, it, it's interesting as well that um, he, his son Hamnet dies, and then a few years later he happens to read uh, a Dutch text called Amleth and thinks, mm. "Hmm, I should combine these two things." Yes, uh, Danish. Yes. Yes. Sorry, Danish text. I'd, yeah. I'll blame the beer. Belgian text, yeah. Uh, no, absolutely right. I mean, Saxo Grammaticus's uh, Doings of the Danes is, uh, you know, kind of a huge compendious volume all about Danish history, which features a narrative about Amlet, A-M-L-E-T-H. So that's the origin, you know, kind of etymologically of the name Hamlet. Hamlet is a near correspondence and it has no other bearing on it. And as we were saying the other day, if you want to commemorate your dead son, and I say I, I choose my words extremely carefully, um, would you really choose to do so through the medium of a play that turns your son into a 30-year-old incel with the hots <laughs> for his mum who goes mad and tries to kill kings? Yeah. <laughs> it's just not and you're dead the entire time. Yeah, and you, you've also killed yourself. Um, yeah. it, it, it's up there with the uh, the theory that Macbeth is a homage of some kind to uh, James I, stroke the sixth. Um, but but improbably so because it, it creates a play in which a Scottish king is shanked in his yeah. bed. I uh, mean, because, because James I had no concerns whatsoever about being assassinated. No, I believe he was he slept easily at night. Yeah, he was, yeah, he was not, not even slightly paranoid. And so seeing uh, a play about a king being murdered in his bed wouldn't even be slightly triggering for him. It's not as though the previous monarch had killed his mum. No. I mean, that hadn't happened. So, yeah, I mean, that's just, yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. And no, no one had ever attempted to explode him or anything. No, that didn't happen either. Um, <laughs> yeah, so if you're doing a homage to near and, you know, nearest and dearest and next of kin, I, I, I would definitely suggest don't kill them in your play or make them seem mad. Um, yeah. <laughs> top tip. We, we will do a full analysis of Hamlet at some point because I think we have to. I think it's compulsory. Yeah, I mean... I, I obviously this evening, ce soir, we, we are intending to go through the, the list of blessed memory. Here it is. Uh, <laughs> you actually get to see the list. Yes. I mean, I've referred to this thing so many times and it's like it's an old friend. You know, it's kind yeah. of build you. It's, uh, it's faded and uh, smelly. Um, but it's, it's point 22 onwards. But yeah, in terms of this kind of like whole shakedown of Hamlet, 
That's what John Dover Wilson offers in his uh, essay, What Happens in Hamlet. And just yet another inevitable shout out to Ant Lord Dean because he recommended that book. Um, and obviously I, I'm the guy that's read um, G. Wilson Knight and T.S. Eliot and Harold Bloom, everybody on Shakespeare, uh, Coleridge, you name it. And I'd not read Wilson, not certainly not uh, um, the whole thing. So uh, yeah, that was a fantastic essay. So we should do the same thing. We should do a John Dover Wilson analysis of Hamlet, scene mm. by scene, but from a uh, unique, ludic, anarchic perspective. Ludic anarchic is the, the best way to describe. I think the I've got closed captions on um, for no real reason, but it's it's heard as ludicrous anarchic, and I love it. <laughs> it's not wrong. <laughs> so uh, Devere, Devere, ce soir. Yes. Yeah, so um, not that any of these uh, emissions, as it were, are seamless, but we did leave off at point twenty one, uh, and really, what what this is to do with is Hamlet. I mean. This is um, essentially, although it's Ayer's book, E-Y-R-E, it's the loony thesis or the loney thesis, um, which is all to do with tying uh, the, the, the Shakespeare corpus or canon, but specifically Hamlet the play to um, De Vere. Um, and just, just, just a little moment that we had today, Joe and I, in the, uh, uh, the, the research centre at our school, we, we were going through all the books from the Marlowe Library and we found an original 1920 edition of J. Thomas Looney's uh, The Man Who Was Shakespeare or whatever it was called. I've got, no, Shakespeare Identified, sorry. Yeah, so uh, yeah. and it was just what, a fantastic moment. Um, yeah, original, very exciting. I mean, more, more exciting than it should have been potentially, but it's been a very <laughs> long day. Oh, yeah. We, we, yeah, we found an original Looney and it made us extremely happy men. Um but we're, we're normal and otherwise married and have children and things. Um, yes. Yes. Yeah. We're, we're totally regular people. Um, <laughs> so kind of riffing on the loony theme, this is air. Um, I, I'll, I'll just quote liberally, but point 22, uh, this is to do with uh, essentially killing people with swords. So uh, air writes Hamlet's stabbing of Polonius. Pardon me. <laughs> I've just. Uh, You're right up there. Yeah, no, I'm, I've, I've there we go. Laptop. Please edit that out. I'm going to literally edit that one no. out. Hang on. <laughs> okay. Hamlet's stabbing of Polonius with a single sword thrust, Act 3, Scene 4, was similar in manner to De Vere's killing of the servant Thomas Brinknell. Um, and what I picked up in my extensive research of this event is that uh, De Vere's at um, Cecil House on the Strand in London, and he's practising his rapier because he's an earl. And uh, some lackey called uh, uh, Brinknell, uh, B-R-I-N-C-K-N-E-L-L, uh, basically walks past at the wrong time. He's killed with a rapier thrust to the thigh uh, on, a summer, on a summer's evening in July 1567. Um, now, that isn't quite the same as the death of Polonius in the play, but um, it, it's certainly not too far off uh, either. Uh, so air notes, page 127.23, that Brignall and Polonius were both in the wrong place at the wrong time. Mm. Uh, it's, not the only, um, it's not the only killing that uh, De Vere was involved with, though, that seems to link quite closely to Shakespeare. Uh, yeah, so uh, digging further, and, and I posted this to the Twitter feed as well. Um, so uh, De Vere... Apart from being estranged from his wife, Anne Cecil, who is essentially Ophelia in Hamlet, um, he had a uh, liaison, uh, very dangereux, as it happens, with a, a, a woman called Anne Vavasor, or Vavasor, um, as a result of which a child was, uh, was engendered. And Queen Elizabeth got wind of this, and obviously she was quite paranoid about events at court, possible rivals, factions forming, and so on. <clears throat> and so she had De Vere sent to the Tower, and the pregnant Anne Vavasa. Um, but on his release, um, De Vere got into a fight with her uncle in the streets of London. I don't really know where. Um, and then as a result of that, several people were killed, or at least one person was killed. And it, and it has that whiff of Act 1, Scene 1 of Romeo and Juliet. Um, mm. Running street battles, people being killed, people intervening. Um, obviously, I'm not saying one thing is the same as the other, but it, it seems to me that we're back in this kind of uh, domain of biographical correspondence. And that's 
that's really quite interesting as it applies to to Oxford. Although you know Marlow was also on several occasions uh, involved in running street battles and people were killed when he was present. Although he didn't um, dispatch anybody himself, as far as I know. Um, and obviously in Elizabethan England, everybody went equipped. You had a dagger, mm. a blade, and if you're a gentleman, you had a sword. But uh, th- these are interesting um, kind of tidbits of information. And as I always say. Um, all of these things pointing Marlow Woods or De Vere Woods, we don't have a single anecdotal shred of evidence that points Stratford Woods. We just don't. No, and um, and yes, you can say it's all anecdotal and it's all biographical. Yes, it is, but there's so much of it mm. that eventually all of this um, evidence has to mean something. Yeah, uh, yeah, we, we've we've spoken about this before. It's the accumulation of uh, correspondences and biographical detail. Uh, mm. that, that is most um, provocative. Um, right, point 24. Uh, I mean, this is this is more of the same, really. It's, an, it's a link point, but it takes you directly to <clears throat> Act 5, Scene 1 uh, of Hamlet. So Brinknell, uh, having rushed between Oxford and uh, whoever he was dueling with or training with, uh, was a judge to have committed suicide, if you can believe it. I mean, this is this is the privilege of power. You know, this is the proud man's contumely and all that, the insolence of office. Um, mm. Cecil regretted this judgment, I am told, as it left Brinknell's widow penniless. The dead man's widow was made destitute by the suicide verdict as his goods were forfeited and church burial denied. I mean, there's an instant whiff of Ophelia there. Mm. Um so Cecil thought a better verdict, bearing in mind, we, we hear a lot of kind of uh, animus against Cecil, but this is him trying to ensure that a uh, recently bereaved widow uh, isn't left destitute. He thought that a better verdict in the case of Brinknell would have been self-defense rather than suicide. Um, now, in Latin, the verdict would have been se defendendo. Now, the gravedigger in Hamlet uh, says that Ophelia has died se offendendo okay so essentially with that and the argle references from the grave digger you've got some kind of quips on you know kind of plebs who don't understand their latin but it seems almost as though de vere is uh, referencing his own uh, brush with brinknell and how that corresponds with the ophelia death and, and looks forward to the duel with uh, laertes it's just again it's just fantastically biographically um provocative there's even there's a sense of regret in the death of Ophelia, but it almost seems to be um, it's it's kind of ridiculous. The burial scene is ridiculous, mm. and and you could argue that that's Devere pointing out the sheer stupidity of it all. The the two of them are wrestling in a grave. Mm. Yeah, well, we, we we were talking about this earlier, weren't we? That the the whole well, there are other parts of Hamlet that have improbable moments, mm. uh, and they're very hard to fathom because in the whole kind of warp and weft of the play as a kind of theatrical construct, these scenes don't make any sense. Um, I mean, you were referencing earlier this um, this moment during the murder of Gonzago and the mousetrap where Hamlet's making kind of um, country matters jokes yeah. with Ophelia. Um, you know, I mean, that that's kind of like superficially comedic, but it has no bearing on the plot. Um, yeah. and, and Ophelia, whom in the previous scene he was told to get to a nunnery, mm. And yes. and then she just seems to brush off this, this very strange flirtation mm. immediately and ask him what's going on with the mousetrap in the very kind of bland way that mm. she does. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. She says he's, a, he's as good as a prologue and then he's better than one. Yeah. Uh, I, I just wonder if she's just shocked. You know, maybe that, that explains at least her half of the dialogue. She can't believe what she's hearing. But as for him, um, absolutely improbable, really. Mm. Um Okay, point 25. Interesting. Going through. Uh, we're going through all the way to 31 tonight because I added yep. one to the list. I'm really sorry. Uh, <laughs> it's a very short one. Um, <laughs> so th- this is interesting because another way of reading the whole Hamlet uh, being flirty with Ophelia is to see it as a way of signaling to his mum the fact that, um, as he says, here's metal more attractive. You know, he's kind of interested in someone who's not Gertrude, mm. uh, trying to provoke her her jealousy, perhaps. Now, that's the Ernest Jones, Oedipal reading version of things, but what if uh, this was to do with De Vere's relationship with Elizabeth, either as a courtier 
<clears throat> uh, pardon me, a would-be suitor, uh, a son, a lover, both, all. Now, I know we're into the Prince Tudor theory, but um, I, I know serious scholars have left the uh, have left the chat at this point. Uh, not that they were <laughs> ever there, but, you know. Um, th- this, this, this kind of picks up on this next point. So, um, De Vere uh, enjoyed Elizabeth's patronage as a young courtier. I mean, she was at his wedding. He was at her coronation. Um, he, he was a very, very prominent courtier. But then he fell out of favour. He was allotted only token military commands, was denied membership of the Privy Council, was regularly voted down for a garter knighthood and was refused the governorship of Jersey. I mean, that would really piss me off as well. Yeah. <laughs> you know, cause I, I, that. I do like an island. Um, and also the presidency of Wales and the lucrative Cornish tin mining franchise, all sinecures that he coveted. So uh, in, in the world of the court, then, yeah, the, these things matter. And he, he didn't have access to any of them. Um, so then we kind of pivot back to <clears throat> Hamlet and his comment to Rosencrantz, Act 3, Scene 2, uh, Sir, I lack advancement. You know, this idea that he's the heir apparent, and yet he says he, he doesn't have any future. He's got no hope of uh, advancement or promotion. Um, but if you read it biographically as some kind of Deverian reference, it makes a bit more sense. Mm. Um, and Air and also references Sonnet 29, uh, which Stratfordians remember, along with Hamlet, say, are the most autobiographical texts in the canon. <clears throat> um, when in disgrace with fortune in men's eyes, I alone, uh, I all alone, beweep my outcast state. You know, why, why would the writer, if it is Devere, of Hamlet and, and, and the sonnets bewail or beweep his, his outcast state. Well, it's because um, although he was later granted an annuity of a thousand pounds by Elizabeth, there was that terrible period of being um, in the household of William Cecil and, and denied a series of, of kind of um, uh, very, very lucrative um, um, kind of like sources of income. Um, and then later, uh, getting in trouble with Elizabeth, denied all these other kind of sinecures and whatnot that he was he was seeking. So uh, again, it, it kind of takes you back to Hamlet, and it's it's just one of those things that is massively suggestive. And um, could certainly be applied to Marlowe as well, though, who was very much an outcast towards the end of his life. Uh, yeah, I mean, having done the Queen good service overseas and whatnot, and 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 been very naughty and almost not got his uh, MA from Cambridge. Um, yeah, he he then falls foul of of the Privy Council. Um, obviously, the the Baines note, the accusations of homosexuality, atheism, um, the, the the whole kind of whiff of this improper relationship with Sir Thomas Walsingham. Yeah, I mean, this could also be a Marlowe, uh, and mm. that that is, I mean, we again we we've chatted a lot about this today, but um, I think on the Marlowe reading, yes, you do have to take into account the fact that Marlowe himself may had he survived fifteen ninety three. Have had very similar feelings to De Vere. Um, mm. He's he's gone into witness relocation in Ravenna or wherever it is, and he and he too feels that he is uh, beweeping his outcast state. So yeah, yeah. Just um, we we do consider all of the possible mm. um, eventualities. We're not we're not set in stone as as um, Oxfordians. No, although it's the way I lean more than any other. Uh, yeah, I too lean Oxford Woods, <clears throat> but just to kind of reference. Um, Barry Clark's, Dr. Clark's book again. Um, I'm reading this because I was uh, talking to Kate Cassidy. Hello, Kate. Uh, author of Secret Work of an Age. Quick plug. Mm-hmm. Available on Amazon. Go and buy a copy. <clears throat> I was talking to her about um, uh, the Bacon uh, uh, angle. And I, what, what I said to her is, is there like an equivalent of Looney, War or Hoffman for Bacon? And then she's very interested in in, in kind of synchronicity and serendipity and and all the rest of it. Literally, I don't actually know. I mean, he reached out to us, didn't he? So yeah. he, he just he just pops into our inbox, as it were. And now I'm reading this book on Bacon. So um, not only are we not uh, refusing to listen to alternative theories, including the Stratford thesis, but mm. no one seems to propose that very vigorously. It's just assumed. Um, yeah, it's the standard position <laughs> with, with yeah. little evidence to back it up. And, and, and as two people with English degrees and the rest, and, and with between us getting on for 40 years of English teaching experience. Mm-hmm. Of course, we know what the Stratfordian position is because we lived and breathed it. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it, it is interesting the way kind of things kind of coincide 
and suddenly I'm reading a book on on bacon about whom I knew very little and <laughs> whether or not I uh, really go for the you know bacon was involved in the first folio bacon was heavily involved in the production of the plays of Shakespeare theory or not uh, the, the guy was hugely intriguing um, yeah. I, I've learned so much about him recently <clears throat> um, and I'll pick up on a point about about him in a second that would be point 27 but this is point 26 um, in April 1576 on his return home from travels in France Germany and Italy pertinent mm. uh, the Italian at Earl uh, De Vere's ship was intercepted and boarded by sea robbers they're not called pirates it's very politically correct this sea robbers <laughs> not only the sea <laughs> robbing it yeah so is that just fishermen <laughs> well I, exactly yeah i mean i might write to mr air or his estate and and suggest a, a revision um <laughs> not only were his chests and boxes stolen but his expensive clothes were stripped off and he oxford was roughly treated um on the above loss of clothes compare hamlet's comment i am set naked in your kingdom of, of act, in act five of hamlet um, and obviously Hamlet is also boarded by pirates on his way to England uh, on, on the command of Claudius to go and collect the tribute from the English, uh, during which voyage, of course, he fingers packets and gets up mm. to all kinds of shenanigans on board, but also um, apparently repels a, a piratical assault on his person, makes friends with the pirates. I think that's brilliant. Um, yeah. And and then they, they they sail him back to Denmark. Yeah. Um, I mean, in the most exciting scene to happen off stage in any Shakespeare play. Yeah, I mean, it should have been in the play, shouldn't it? I mean, yeah. hoist with your own petard and all that stuff about fingering the packet. Just just Rosencrantz and Grillenstone's faces when they realise that he's he's kind of double-crossed them. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, th that would be a fantastic scene. The English court as Rosencrantz and Grillenstone, the king opens his letter, um, looks up at them. I mean, on that, I mean, I don't know, and I'm going to embarrass myself if I've forgotten, but I don't think that scene is picked up on by Tom Stoppard in Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. No. I don't think he goes think there so. either. So, I mean, tell us if we're wrong, but um, if so, I will reread it as a penance. But, yeah, I mean, that would be an amazing scene. But, yeah, it's just skimmed over. But William Shaxpert of Stratford, 1564 to 1616, does not, as far as I'm aware... Uh, have any, uh, w w did never, as far as I'm aware, uh, uh, sail anywhere, still less was boarded by pirates, still less was landed in Denmark after the event. Mm -hmm. I mean, that to me is uh, pertinent. Um, right, <clears throat> pardon me, point 27. So we're, we're into uh, kind of like the historical, but also literary underpinnings of Hamlet um, and how it came to be written. So uh, William Cecil's library, <clears throat> which we know was extensive. I mean, probably not as big as John Dee's, but stunningly uh, well-equipped. Um, it contained a text called Belforest, which I imagine is Belfore in French, Histoire Tragique, Tragic Histories or Tragic Stories. Now, that's one of the primary sources of Hamlet. Um, mm -hmm. So it's kind of Saxo Grammaticus here and Belforest over there. Um, so that was written in French. OK, and De, uh, De Vere spoke French. Now, again, that's not conclusive, but Billy Boy didn't speak French, as far as I'm aware. Uh, not that we're aware of. That wasn't on the curriculum at the Stratford Grammar School, which he may not have attended anyway. I, um, I was reading about this earlier. Apparently, um, the Stratford Grammar School was... Um, the, the, the Shakespeare's were, were quite well-known um, Catholics. Hmm. And the head teacher at the time was very much Protestant, and so it's quite likely John Shakespeare would never have sent his son there. Yeah. When you read James Shapiro's contested will, he argues the other way, which is to say his father was a prominent merchant, he'd been, you know, Lord Mayor or Alderman or, or what have you, but fails to mention uh, anything about his religious leanings. Um, yeah, because, because England had no issues with the two religions at the time. No, I think they everything were, was fine. Quite nicely, yeah. I mean,. Yeah. Very good terms with each other. I mean, there wasn't a continental land war about it or anything like that. No, nothing like that was going on. <clears throat> no, 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 armadas didn't happen. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, and this, this is the thing about <laughs> this is the brilliant thing I found out about Francis Bacon because no doubt in previous podcasts, our many thousands of Baconian listeners have, have, have been screaming at their um, a device. Uh, why do you keep saying that it's significant that De Vere was a ward, a royal ward in the household of Cecil? So was Bacon. So just to kind of put that one firmly on the record, 
Sir Francis Bacon, um, philosopher, statesman, scientist, him, he was also a ward of court at Cecil House. Yep. Um, so that gives him access to everything we just talked about, all the primary texts for Shakespeare, for, for Hamlet, sorry, um, access to um, uh, William Cecil's long-winded after-dinner speeches, his uh, uh, precepts to uh, Thomas Cecil, a.k.a. Laertes. So, yeah, I, I acknowledge that in terms of autobiographical proximity to one of the major figures influencing Hamlet... Bacon's claim is as good as De Vere's. Almost as if, if there was some sort of group theory that Bacon and De Vere would have some kind of link to one another. Back to Barry. <laughs> uh, yeah, Barry Barry calls the the De Vere or the Marlowe or the Derbyite or the Countess of Pembroke, blah, blah, blah theory, a single hand theory for obvious reasons. Uh, and what we call a group theory, he calls a multiple hand theory because obviously he's interested more in uh, stylometrics and mm -hmm. text analysis, but it's the same thing, obviously. Um, and uh, yeah, he, he himself is not married to the proposition that it has to be bacon, do or die, because that yeah. you, you paint yourself into a series of corners with that. Um, when Ros Barber's brilliant interview uh, is put out uh, in, a, in, a, in a few days, weeks, whenever we do it, you'll hear her talking about um, the fact that although Marlowe has a super strong claim in her view, lots of textual parallelisms and so forth. Um, she, she herself is happy to dwell in that Keatsian negative capability, which mm. Elizabeth Winkler talks about when she interviews uh, Ros Barber for her brilliant book. Um, and, and that's that state of not yet forming a, an opinion that is definite and concrete because there is not sufficient evidence upon which to base that opinion. Uh, and then you have to compare that to people from, let's say, the other side of the aisle who, who get to very profoundly concrete conclusions based on what I would describe as wiki biography. Mm. Uh, so just I thought I'd be a bitch tonight. So there you go. That's my bitchy moment. <laughs> it's the beer. It's out of my system. Yeah. Apart from the, well, the beer, isn't it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> right. Point 28 of 31. Uh, I have no idea how far in we are. Are we, are we going to be kicked off again or? Oh, no, um, we've we've got good Zoom now. Okay, right. <laughs> good Zoom. Like it. Okay. Um, the two sons of Oxford's Uncle Geoffrey okay, provided the nation with its most renowned soldiers, air rights, Sir Horace Veer and his younger brother, Francis Veer. Mm -hmm. Well, they sound like Horatio and Francisco in Hamlet. Now, no one's yep. saying they are. But, you know, with the Peregrine Bertie ambassador to Denmark related to De Vere angle, with the multiple accumulative kind of biographical uh, uh, details linking um, uh, De Vere to uh, the play, if you add in a, a Horace Horatio and a Francis Francisco, then it, it does sound awfully, uh, again, provocative. Uh, those two guys are known as the Fighting Veres, and Horace was actually called Sir Horatio Vere, 1565 uh, to 1635, Oxford's cousin. Again, uh, it's not so much that that's a slam dunk as I'm waiting to hear Stratford boys link to anything in Denmark. Yep. Could he find it on a map? I don't know. Um, okay, point 29. Uh, th yeah, this is to do with that very strange relationship between Oxford and his wife, Anne. Uh, or Hamlet Ophelia. Uh, Oxford was at sea on active service when his wife Anne was buried. Uh, that's the 5th of June, 1588. And that mirrors uh, Hamlet's absence from Ophelia's funeral service. Now, obviously, you could say, well, no, he was meant to be packed off to England to be killed. So in the text, he's not on active uh, military service and whatnot, but he is, he is on a boat. And mm. uh, I believe Oxford was involved with the Armada fleet or with the engagement with the Armada. So... Um, given that the year Oxford was at sea was 1588, which is Armada year, uh, I actually think, no, that is actually a very good correspondence to Hamlet. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, it's never conclusive, but given that we've had three videos on this guy <laughs> and any number of points, uh, you know, th this is where I think this is where we got with De Vere. It's kind of uncanny and unsettling, and you just can't explain it away. Yeah. Um, 
Right, point 30 of 31. Thank God. Here we go. <clears throat> uh, nearly there. <laughs> it's only taken about six months. Yeah. Um, Henry Peacham's exhaustive, exhaustive list of English poets, The Complete English Gentleman, published in 1622, uh, references, obviously, the best English poets of the, the time. The list that Peacham produces in that text is headed by Edward, Earl of Oxford, but omits any reference to a poet named Shakespeare. Mm. Um, I mean, you, you again, we were talking today, you've got Paladis to Tamia by uh, Francis Mears, 1598, who, who directly references Shakespeare. That's where we get the Sugared Sonnets reference from. But he doesn't say Shakespeare, comma, you know, the guy from Stratford. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, certainly by 1622, when Peachum was writing, the Earl of Oxford was uh, the, the, the daddy. Yeah, uh, and, and Shakespeare d didn't get a look in. Um, so that that's interesting and, and and you know relevant, I would suggest. And that brings us to the final point, <clears throat> and this is just a throw out point because, um, kind of going back to my John Dover Wilson uh, nonsense, in his uh, essay, what happens in Hamlet, which everyone should read again. Thank you, mm -hmm. and Lord Dean. We 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 are not worthy. It was such a good shout out. It was such a good genuine record. legend. It's just brilliant. It, yeah. um, you know, all the bin night references, you know, all the reminders. Thank you for those as well. Uh, but yeah, you recommended this book and Dover Wilson refers to, quote, Polonius, the Burley of the Court of Elsinore. That's in uh, John Dover Wilson, What Happens in Hamlet, Appendix, Appendix F, page 331. Well, John Dover Wilson is like, I, I would imagine, a load of current Stratfordians. He, you know, like when we read the uh, Arden edition footnotes to Hamlet and they say this line is also used by Marlowe uh, or that, you know, Polonius is taken as a caricature of William Cecil, Lord Burley. I always think, why don't you follow that thought to its logical conclusion? <laughs> and, and, and Dover Wilson doesn't. I just think he was scared. But if Polonius is the Burley of the court of Elsinore, it, it follows that he is Burley. And then, obviously, that gives you two possible um, candidates. It gives you a De Vere here and a, a Bacon there. But why not both? You know, you don't have to choose between them. Well, yeah, certainly, so uh, certainly. That's my list. Fantastic. So, um, De Vere, um, there's, there, I mean, there's definitely more to say. Uh, one thing we were discussing earlier today was that um, <clears throat> we, we were amazed that uh, Shakespeare, who had no... As far, I mean, there was no record of having any formal education. But he certainly didn't go to university because there would be a record there, um, even if he did go to, to grammar school. Mm -hmm. And yet no one seems to be annoyed. None of the university-educated writers seem to be particularly annoyed that this upstart is is creating <clears throat> in, in this way. And um, uh, this this no, no mark, no education guy has just come up and then with all their fancy, expensive schooling has not. And yet people would be bitter about this and um and we've already debunked the, the green uh, i'm not having that yeah i mean robert green's attack in the groats with the wit pamphlet if he wrote it <clears throat> pardon me um you know the one that talks about the upstart crow and the shake scene mm. um if that's not ned allen founder of dulwich college etc and it probably is because you know shake um upstart crow uh he was from a oh, the magpie wasn't it yeah Absolutely, his, 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 his family for, for over 200 years, I think, in the end, they they ran a pub called The the Pie. And obviously mm -hmm. the pie is uh, magpie. And magpies yeah. are corvids and corvids are crows. And that's the upstart crow. But if it isn't him, <clears throat> as a lot of scholars think it is, and it is Shakespeare, um, <clears throat> what you're being told is that this is a guy who takes plays that don't belong to him and he beautifies himself with other people's feathers. You know, he literally steals other people's texts, ideas, yep. themes. Um, and, and and obviously, on the back of that, as we discussed earlier today, you've got Johnson's epigram on Poetape. And uh, again, a lot of mainstream scholars hold that that is a uh, a, a vignette, if you like, on, on Shakespeare, Shakespeare, the London boy, uh, as in, you know, the, the London uh, play manager. Uh, but if it is, what does it tell you? Well, he apes other people's styles. He's a play broker. He buys in uh, plays that have been been on stage elsewhere that, that, that aren't mm -hmm. in production anymore. 
he buys them in, gains the, in inverted commas, copyright, because copyright didn't exist, but hey-ho, puts his name on them, probably hyphenated, Shakespeare. Um, <clears throat> and, and that's Johnson's uh, kind of riff on, on the Stratford guy. Um, mm. Yeah, but you're right. Um, all the university wits, when they were having their battle of the theatres, <clears throat> in the late 1590s into the early 1600s, um, Johnson versus uh, Daniels and Marston and all these other people, uh, they, they were bitching and moaning and swiping at one another. Uh, and, it, and it all got very catty. And I imagine they were all kind of bricking it, pun intended, that Johnson <laughs> might, you know, do them in. Um, so why not make that the basis of your complaint about Billy Boy from Stratford or Stratty Bill, as I call him now? The, the, the most popular, arguably, playwright of that specific era. Yeah. And if he was literally a nobody from the provinces and let, let I mean, people have done this before. Let's grant him <clears throat> five years education at Stratford Grammar School where English wasn't taught, by the way. Um, what would he have left with? Well, he would have left with the same kind of thing that everybody else in the country had and no more. But he, if you compare that to a Johnson at Westminster or a Marlowe at King's and Corpus Christi uh, or a De Vere at the Inns of Court. And I mean, uh, you know, De Vere's uh, Oxford and Cambridge degrees were honorary and that was like weaponized and used against me a, a few months ago. Like uh, that means he wasn't intelligent. <laughs> he, he was privately tutored by William Cecil. Queen Elizabeth was privately tutored. So it seems to me that mm. that's a senseless and stupid quibble by Stratfordians. Um, well, yeah, you know who wasn't given any kind of honorary degree? <laughs> William Shakespeare. Really? Yeah. Hey, didn't he didn't he have to buy his coat of arms and wasn't he uh, yep. wasn't he denied it on the first application? I think he was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Surely somebody at the uh, records office or whatever it was <clears throat> was like, "No, hang on a minute. This is this guy from Stratford who wrote Lear and Othello yeah. and the sonnets." You, you think when when Othello and, and and Hamlet came out, they would have maybe thought about giving him some kind of honorary degree? I'd have thought so. I'd have thought maybe throw in a, a knighthood or something. God knows, yeah. yeah. Maybe a minor dukedom. Uh, Some kind uh, of title, which, of course, he never he never got. Yeah, the kind of title given to Sir William Cecil, for example, who wasn't born an aristocrat. You know, little things like that. Um, yeah, it, it has been a day of uh, uh, extra information and uh, kind of like really kind of mapping mm. out ideas. It's been a really good day in that respect. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, uh, another book we looked at was, uh, it, this This was in the Marlowe Library Collection, by the way, you Baconians. Um, it's a text by a chap called Edwin Reed uh, from 1992, and it's called Bacon and Shakespeare Parallelisms. Mm -hmm. So I just thought I'd throw that in there because uh, the, the normal kind of uh, expectation is Marlowe and Shakespeare. Yeah. Oh, pardon me, parallelisms, but... Um, there are Baconian ones in the mix as well. So, uh, yeah. yeah, we now have we now have access to this amazing resource. So you'll be getting more and more yeah. uh, research stuff as we as we get work our way through it. Well, don't forget we, we we also found today as oh, we didn't um, our, our friends from the Marlowe Society were rummaging, and as they had their rummage, they found a first folio, uh, sixteen oh four, we think ish, ish. <clears throat> you know, whatever, some somewhere around that time, maybe it's like sixteen twenty. Uh, first folio uh, complete works of uh, Beaumont and Fletcher, which which is now at, at at our school, in in a cupboard locked away probably. Uh, <laughs> it's it's been a day of remarkable discoveries, and we uh, we yeah. found we we found Marlowe's wood, didn't we? <laughs> yes, Marlowe's old wood, Marlowe's crusty old wood. We it's did. In a box. It was in a box. Yeah. We might, I, I don't think we should explain that. I think we'll, we'll do no, that. We'll, we'll leave that as is. In that case, yeah. we'll, we'll start the wind down. Yes. Um, thank you ever so much for listening, uh, if indeed you still are. Um, I uh, would love it if you would email us. We, we do reply to and read all of our emails. I mean, you've heard us um, reading, dot, reading uh, Dr. Clark's book. He contacted us. Um, <clears throat> Christian just immediately went and bought his book. Yes, and has, and has begun to read it. So it's, um, you know, we genuinely love to hear from you. Um, so please do get in touch. We are on um, much ado about the AQ, all one word, at gmail.com. Um, don't write all one word. It's just much ado about the AQ at gmail.com. Yeah, do um, we are both on uh, Twitter, which uh, on which I am uh, at Glum Chicken. And and don't I, ask why. I recently, I recently changed my name to much ado about the AQ uh, yep. because of the AQ anon. 
uh, kind of conspiracy nonsense that uh, yeah. actually I was quite interested in at the time, but I gave it up, don't worry. Uh, but Christian's tag is still indeed AQ underscore Anon76486. <laughs> um, so he is still that on there. I'm also on Blue Sky, which is like Twitter, but more sensible um, with, the same, with the same tag, but I haven't put anything on there uh, as of yet. And we will um, have a YouTube channel in the near future, which will, of course, be called Much To Do About The AQ. When I say the near future, if you're listening to this, then I've set it up by now. So <laughs> now, I guess. <laughs> yeah, go, um, go watch it. So um, with, with all that done, that's um, Devere uh, put to bed for now. He'll be back, I've no yep. doubt. He keeps coming up, does, uh, does old Eddie boy. Yep. And um, look forward, please, next week to welcoming Elizabeth Winkler, who was a fantastic guest. Uh, the following week to uh, Dr. Ros Barber. Mm-hmm. Um, we probably won't uh, be recording again before Christmas mm-hmm. because um, that's the next two weeks. So have a fantastic uh, holiday season, whatever you celebrate. Mm-hmm. Have a break from work or whatever it is that you do. Uh, don't do that for a little bit. Mm-hmm. And do less, eat good food, yeah. and time with people, etc. Take it easy. Mm. C- consider, um, consider imbibing Belgian beer because it really is very good. Um, yeah, I mean, I was never a Belgian beer man. I was always a, an English beer kind of man. But I'm, I'm, I wouldn't say I was converted, but I will certainly consume the odd Belgian now and then. With a Kenneth Williams slant, it's better in a chalice. I'll, um, I will, I'll recommend the beer that I've had this evening, which is called Zot. Mm. Which will be backwards on your screen, possibly. Yeah, uh, Zot. Toz. Um, I, um, although usually I will drink. Shep Neem's double stout mm. um, or any imperial stout I can get my hands on. I recommend Time and Tide Brewery as well. They're very good. They are fantastic. They do a very good IPA, double IPA, and if you're man enough, a triple IPA. And they do one called Ham Sandwich and uh, Soup Dragon, and that's fantastic. But the best beer in existence is West Marla. West Marla? Um, West, West Marla, and I expect them to now uh, sponsor this channel. If, if you sponsor us, we would accept payment in crates. Yes, uh, she may in that case. I also like you, Ho Garden, great fan. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I mean, genuinely, any local Kent brewer, Mad Cat, are very good. Just give yeah. a shout. We've spoken too long about beer. Um, no, I'm no, going to sign off. I don't think we've spoken enough. I think we should be sponsored by Time and Tide. I think, yeah, um, we'll give them a shout. I'll, I'll send them an email. <laughs> uh, all right, um, thank you again for listening, and um, we will speak to you again soon. You haven't got the bell, have you? I don't have the bell. Look, I- I'm going to do it because it might work, but it might not. But I, I used to work at uh, an local uh, uh, independent uh, boarding establishment and a, and a really nice Japanese student got me a Japanese Christmas card and it plays, plays a jingle that is not Japanese. So see if you can pick this up. Uh, I have no idea where the speaker is because it's a card, but let's go for it. Are you getting that? Just the, the most awkward of silences. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to make a beer-based noise. Thank you for listening, everyone, um, and call in next time. Thank you.